So this morning as we get into Luke chapter 21, um, you know, people love to talk about the end times. When I was a young Christian, um, the end times was a really, really big topic. And there were prophecy updates and people were really looking for the signs and they were thinking that it could be any day in fact, why worry about the job that you're, you've got? Why worry about the credit that uh, is amassing on your credit card, the debt on your credit card? Because Jesus is going to come back any day. We don't need to worry about that stuff. Well, you know, it, it actually didn't happen. I joke about this often. There was a book written, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 1988. And uh, for those of you who are not alive in 1988, I bet you're kind of glad that Jesus didn't come back in 1988. So the, the excitement over the end times kind of has died down since then. The guy has not written the sequel to his book, you know, 89 reasons, 90 reasons, or anything like that. But it doesn't mean that, that it, there's not truth to the fact that Jesus will return to set up his kingdom on earth. It doesn't uh, do away with the truth that there are signs that Jesus says will accompany the time before he returns. We looked at some of those a little bit last week. We're going to look at it a little bit more this week. Jesus is going to give us kind of a preview of coming attractions. And I think important for us today are some suggestions about how we ought to live our lives while we are waiting for that day to happen, for him to return and to him, for him to rule and reign physically on earth. Now, in the first part of chapter 21, Jesus outlined for the Jews what would take place about 40 years after he spoke those words when the Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem, broke through the walls, and destroyed the temple. And that event and the signs leading up to it would kind of mirror what would take place as it, the time approaches for Jesus to return to earth. Now, if you missed the study last week, I would really encourage you to go out and listen to it or watch it online at our website, calvarynewberg.org. You can also read the, the notes uh, for the study because we talked about how there will be political, human, natural, and cosmic cataclysms that will take place that seek to draw us off from our primary mission, which is to be transformed into God's image and to be used to bring the gospel into the lives of many. And there were some key points at the end of that message that I really want you to pay attention to. And this morning, we're going to pick up on that a little bit. And there are two other things that I want to talk about in terms of that same idea. Because if you belong to Jesus Christ, there is an enemy who hates you, and he wants to make it really hard for you to serve God. But there are some important things that we can do as Christians in the face of those difficulties. So let's begin now in chapter 21, verse 25. G or Luke here now switches the focus from the near term up to 70 AD to the far term, a time yet future to us. So verse 25. Then there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and there will be anguish on the earth among nations bewildered by the roaring sea and waves. People will faint from fear and expectation of the things that are coming on the world because the celestial powers will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is near. So Jesus begins with the word then in this paragraph. Now, what does that refer to? Well, just the very sentence prior to that, if you look at back at verse 24, he says that the, the, they, the, the, uh, the Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword, be led captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles. And then look at this last key phrase, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We talked a little bit about this last week, but Jesus seems to be referring here back to the times of the Gentiles. Now, many scholars believe this refers to the period of time in which we live right now. When the Gentiles are being welcomed into God's kingdom, 
by becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11. He speaks of Israel because they rejected Jesus as their Messiah of being cut off from the olive tree and that we Gentiles are grafted in. When that last person bows their heart and their life to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then the times of the Gentiles will be complete. And it is at that time, I believe, and I'm joined by many others, that Jesus will come back for his church. This is what's known as the rapture. And Paul, the apostle, outlines this taking place in his first letter to the Thessalonians. And you can jot down 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I'm going to read it for you. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, that is, those who have died in Christ, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first." then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So we get the word rapture in English from the Greek word that is used in 1 Thessalonians when Paul says in verse 17, we will be caught up together. Now, the Greek word there, caught up, is the word harpazo, and it means to pluck. In fact, more specifically, the word means to pick a ripe piece of fruit off of a tree, to pluck it very quickly. So that word harpazo translates into Latin with the word rapturo. So now you can see where we get the word rapture. In English, oftentimes the word is kind of misused. Oh, I'm enraptured in love and this sort of thing. But the, the, the base meaning is still there, and that is to be caught up with something, to be entranced by something. But the actual technical word uh, that's used in the Greek is to pluck. So when uh, Paul says that those who are dead in Christ, who have fallen asleep, will rise, and then we who are alive at the coming of the Lord, he will descend from heaven with a shout, and we will be caught up to be with him. Now, that, to, in, in my reading of Scripture, and my study of the Word, begins what will be a very difficult time on planet Earth, the time that is being described here in verses 25 through 28, known as the Tribulation, the final three and a half years as the Great Tribulation, where it will literally be hell on Earth. Now, what's taking place are really two things. God is judging a rebellious world, and he is preparing to return to that world in order to take up his throne. But it is a difficult time, and Jesus is coming back to take the title deed to planet Earth away from Satan, Lucifer, because we had charge over the earth, and we gave ourselves over to him. And you can check out Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 1. In fact, uh, if you're a, a Bible student, I have sprinkled all kinds of ver- references throughout the study notes that you can pick up later, and you can see where I'm referencing some of the things that I'm talking about, because, oh, if we had the time, we could turn to the book of the Revelation and really look at this, and Joel and Daniel and all the places where these times are talked about. But essentially, Lucifer knows he's got planet Earth. He does not want to give up control. And so there's this kind of real struggle that takes place. But I believe that we who belong to Jesus Christ will not actually be present for that very difficult time. And I understand that there are various different views on that. I take a premillennialist view, which uh, means that the church gets snatched away, raptured out of the scene, that the final seven years of planet Earth are a time of great difficulty, as the enemy fights to keep control and the Lord judges earth and then prepares to return. During that time, I believe we are celebrating 
the marriage feast of the Lamb. We took communion this morning. And in that section of Matthew where we read, Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you again. And I won't go into great detail, and oh, again, if we had the time, the symbolism of the Last Supper uh, as the Passover feast is amazing. And Jesus, when he was taking the cup, and, or taking the different cups and drinking them, the cup he said he was not going to drink corresponds to the idea of, I will take you to be where I am. You can check out Exodus and look at the Passover to see what those different cups mean because there's this like fourfold thing that takes place. So when we get caught up to be with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb, He has taken us to be where He is. We're in His presence. And then we're going to have this wonderful feast where we're going to celebrate what He's done and then we're going to prepare to return with Him riding white horses. I always have to add that detail because I think it's cool. As the armies of God coming back with him to rule and reign over this planet. You can check out Revelation chapter 19 for some interesting information about the marriage supper of the Lamb and then us returning with him. So what happens here on earth leading up to his return? That's the focus of these verses that we see here. Primarily, I think these words are written to those who are still here during this period of time those that are left on earth after the rapture takes place, and most specifically, the nation of Israel. Now, last week, Jesus told his disciples not to be distracted by the disasters that will be taking place around them, but to continue to preach the gospel. You can see that in chapter 21, verse 9. But during the tribulation period, the events on and surrounding earth will be so intense that God actually provides a timetable, a way for people to count down the days until the time of Jesus' return. And there are various scriptures that talk about this, but there is a, um, there's a prophecy that, that's called time, times, and half a time. You guys may have heard of that before. And uh, again, boy, if we only had time, I'd just love to get into this. <laughs> But that seven-year period is actually broken up into two pieces. And what happens is the enemies attempt to replace the Messiah, known as the Antichrist. And anti doesn't mean uh, opposed to, although it can. It really means replacement. So the enemy is going to come up with his own Messiah. And that Messiah is going to make peace in the Middle East where no one has been able to make peace before. And if anybody tells you that, that uh, there's peace in the Middle East... They ain't reading their newspapers because it's just getting worse and worse. And, and, and Israel and the Middle East are in the papers every single day. And much of the, the murder and mayhem that takes place around the world today has in its root the fact that Israel has come back to their land. So the Antichrist will come up on the scene. He will be able to... Uh, bar, uh, uh, broker this peace that no one has been able to do. And everybody, including the Jews, will absolutely marvel. They'll fall down on their faces and worship this guy. Halfway through the seven-year peace agreement, this guy will go into the rebuilt temple and he will declare himself to be God. At that moment, the Jews can count down three and a half years, 1260 days, and they know at the end of that time that the hell that will be unleashed on earth will be over when Jesus returns. It will be that horrible. Notice what is said here. It talks about time, um, signs. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. That probably comes from Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 32, where the prophet Joel declares, I will display wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awe-inspiring day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. For there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised among the survivors the Lord calls. So all of these signs 
are picked up in other uh, prophecies. Also in the book of the Revelation, you can uh, reference uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, chapter 9, verse 18, and then chapter 19, verse 18. But what I want to focus on here is look at what he says in verse 25. There will be anguish on the earth among the nations bewildered by the roaring seas and waves. Later on, he says, people will faint from fear and expectation. Strong emotions, difficult times. Revelation chapter 6, in fact, details some of that same emotion. Things will be so bad that the people will actually call upon the hills to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the Lamb who has come to judge heaven and earth. People will recognize that what's taking place here is a judgment from God for rebellion against him, and it will be frightening beyond your imagining. Then at the end of that seven-year period of time, Jesus will return, and we pick that up in verse 27. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. How many of you have seen the movie <clears throat> Independence Day? How many of you saw the new version of Independence Day, the 20th anniversary or whatever it was? Well, there's a scene in there. I don't recommend movies, but there's a scene in there I've heard of that um, you see this giant alien spacecraft coming to Earth, and it is entering Earth's atmosphere, and you don't see the craft at all. All you see are flames and smoke as <clears throat> this craft enters the atmosphere and the friction is causing all of this um, heat to be dissipated and, and the fire and the smoke. And, and I kind of picture that when, <clears throat> when I picture the Lord returning in a cloud with great power and glory. The Lord said, for as lightning flashes from the horizon to horizon and lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. The Lord's going to put on a show. <clears throat> There's no question about it. People will absolutely know from one end of the earth to the other that the Lord is coming back. And that will be a glorious day. He says, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption, redemption is near. And it will be so awful here on planet earth that people will finally be able to lift their heads up and go, it's coming. He's here. And it's important. The timetable, the signs, the fact that the Lord's going to come in glory and great power. Because as Jesus said in Matthew 24, which is the parallel passage to what we're reading here in Luke chapter 21, Jesus makes this astounding statement. He says, unless those days were limited, no one would survive. But those days will be limited because of the elect. You see, there are going to be people during that final seven-year period that recognize the judgment and also the Messiah. Among them will be large numbers from the nation of Israel who will come back to the Lord as their Messiah. So Jesus wants them to know, especially those people left, that if they can count to 1260, if they have eyes, if they have ears, they can hold on during those toughest possible times, waiting and longing for him to come and put an end to it. So verse 29, then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put out leaves, you can see for yourselves and recognize that summer is already near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. I assure you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass pass away. So the Lord uses the analogy of a tree. When the tree starts to leaf out, you know that it's spring and that summer is, it really can't be far behind unless you live in Oregon and you have two days of summer. Can't believe it. September 1st hits and we get rain. What is the deal with that? But anyway, I was out putting down bark yesterday and looking up and I was getting drenched in the rain and suddenly realized I'm in the rain here putting out bark. Maybe I should go inside. <laughs> But anyway, well, what Jesus is saying here is that when these horrible events take place, that people should realize 
that just as the trees leave out, leaf out in spring, summer will come, his return will come. And he said that this generation will not pass away. A lot of ink has been spilled about what that means. The word generation there can mean age. So this age will not pass away. Um, it can mean until the Lord comes back. It can mean generation. Some have used this to say that the, the generation that saw Israel return to the promised land will not pass away until the Lord returns. That was, by the way, the basis for the 1988 return of Jesus Christ because uh, they counted 1948 as the beginning of the modern day nation of Israel. And then they figured, well, a generation in the Bible is 40 years. So I can add 40 to 1948. I get 1988. So there it is. You've got it. Interestingly, though, the Lord said, no one will know the day and the hour, but, you know, that, that, laying that aside. <laughs> the point, though, is that those alive on earth, were he not to return, they would cease to exist. Now, Jesus, in fact, says heaven and earth will pass away, and that's true. You can check out uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, also Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. But he says his word, his promise of his return, the promise of rescue will never pass away. He will never fail, no matter what. So the promise is that that generation, those who are alive, when these signs take place, they'll make it. He will return for them. So what to do with this? Verse 34, so he says, be on guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing, drunkenness, and worries of life, or that day will come on you unexpectedly, like a trap, for it will come on all who live in the face of the whole earth. But be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So verses 34 through 36 are really ones that each one of us, even if we escape, that we should take to heart. The goal is not to have to face those terrible times on planet Earth earth is if possible and then secondly to be able to be in a good place when we stand before the Lord now the Bible tells us that we will all have to give an account to him whether or not we are Christians or whether we are not a lot of times Christians kind of think well you know I, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior and that's it and and it's true you're forgiven you're washed you're cleansed you're going to heaven you're gonna be in, in a place of joy for all of eternity but there is going to be a little entrance interview that we will all have as we come into heaven. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, where he will then evaluate with us what took place, what we did in this life that we lived in him. And it talks about it further, Paul does, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. So you can check that out. But to escape the things of the tribulation, definitely you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Come in during the times of the Gentiles. And I believe very strongly that we will be raptured out of here and will not have to face those final seven years of the wrath of the Lamb on planet Earth. You don't have to be there. To stand before Jesus in the best possible place, my advice is to follow what Jesus says right here. Right at the beginning of verse 34, he says, be on guard. And the word there in the Greek means to fully engage your mind. Fully engage your mind. Now, in another place, the apostle Peter, who heard Jesus say these words, he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, he says, to be sober and prayerful in our approach to life. Now, that echoes what Jesus says here in this admonition. He says in verse 36, to be alert and in prayer at all times. The word alert there means to stay sleepless. And it doesn't mean you can't sleep. But the idea is that in, in terms of 
knowing who you are, knowing what's going on in your life around you, you are alert. And it's the opposite of the condition that he talks about in verse 34, about our minds being dulled from carousing drunkenness and worries of life. There are two enemies to a growing Christian. The intoxicants and the anxieties of this age. The idea of being dulled there in verse 34 is literally to have your heart weighed down, stopping you from living a dynamic Christian life. In fact, the Greek word means to be stuck in place. You're not going anywhere. You get that way when the temptations of this age to incorporate this age's values into your life intoxicate you. When we read about carousing drunkenness and drunkenness, we think about, oh, you know, I don't drink alcohol or I don't drink very much, so I'm good there. I don't think that's really what's in view. It is in view, but it's much more than that because he's talking about our minds being dulled through carousing and when the, when the values of this age kind of take over our minds, then we... Um, we begin to think, speak, and act as a reflection of what we see in the culture around us rather than a reflection of the Lord's character. And the word there, carousing, literally means a hangover, a headache, a headache caused from a hangover. And I think that in the mind of a Christian, when you, when you incorporate the values of this age, it's, it's fighting against the values of the kingdom of God that are living in you because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's this cognitive dissonance that takes place in your mind. And then um, drunkenness is really the word intoxicants. And I think that the intoxicants of this world are more than just alcohol, but it's all the values, how we get security, intimacy, and purpose. Those are three important needs that every human has. It's how we fulfill those where we get the difference between the kingdom of God and between the values of this age. He says that the cares of this life will also drag you down. Those are the distractions that this world tries to bring. And those distractions can be good things, like the lure of money and greed, the lure of focusing so much on your physical abilities or your physical appearance that you lose sight of your spiritual fitness and your spiritual uh, appearance. And that um, they can be so distracting that you don't care anymore about your walk with the Lord. Temptations pull your mind away from being alert to the schemes of the enemy. And distractions push your mind away from being stayed on the Lord. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 26. Thou, will keep him, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in you. The temptations and the distractions of this age are a trap, Jesus says. They are a trap. The enemy's goal in your life, if he can't stop you from falling in love with Jesus, is to make you ineffective in your walk and your work for him. But we don't have to fall for his devices. We can be aware of what they are. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So, what is the remedy to temptation and distraction? It's alertness and prayer. So, my two suggestions for us coming out of this portion of Luke chapter 21 is number one, have your spiritual, situational awareness going. And secondly, have an open mic to the Lord. A continual conversation. Paul said it this way, pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that every single thing you do every single time, every moment of the day is prayer, but it means that you never stop praying. And that's one of the main ways that the enemy tries to get in and cut off your relationship with the Lord is to stop you from praying. And so have a situational awareness spiritually. What's going on in my life? What temptations or distractions are coming my way? And then pray about those things to the Lord. 
Okay, so wrapping up then, in verse 37, during the day he was teaching in the temple complex, but in the evening he would go out and spend the night on what is called the Mount of Olives. Then all the people would come early in the morning to hear him in the temple complex. So Luke concludes by showing Jesus' pattern during the week of the crucifixion. He'd show up at the temple complex in the morning. He would find people waiting for him to teach. And then at the end of the day, he would retreat across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. Now, this pattern ends up providing an opportunity for his betrayal. If he just stayed in Jerusalem, the crowds would not have allowed him to be arrested. But going to the Mount of Olives and traversing the Kidron Valley, going through the Garden of Gethsemane, it opened him up to the possibility of a private arrest. And that is exactly what Jesus wants. Everything that takes place is completely within his control. So he's just allowing them to think that they have such control over the situation, but in fact they have absolutely no control whatsoever. So next time in Luke chapter 22, we're going to see this plot to betray Jesus come to fruition. But what can we conclude from this portion of chapter 21? Well, two things really came to my mind. The first thing is that Jesus is the only constant. Jesus is the only constant. The world is going to be in turmoil. We didn't go into detail about a lot of the things that are going to take place. But we, we uh, think about earthquakes and their devastation. We had one in Italy, I think, last week. There was one, the largest earthquake ever recorded in Oklahoma. Who knew that there were earthquakes in Oklahoma, right? And it was puny compared to what we face here in the Pacific Northwest. But even our mega 9.0 uh, Cascadia subduction zone quake will be puny in comparison to the things that will take place. As Jesus said, the, the heavens and the earth will be shaken. And uh, not only do earthquakes cause damage on earth, but because they also happen under the sea, there are tremendous tsunamis that take place. Just absolute devastation. People will be in incredible fear. And you know, even if terrible physical things are not happening around you, there are emotional things that take place. Emotional earthquakes, emotional tsunamis that flow over the top of us. Family members getting, getting tragically killed or sick. Financial ruin coming upon us. Relationships being broken in terrible ways. Different things that we go through in our lives that just seem to, to just take our feet right out from underneath us. And what I think Jesus is saying here is that even in the midst of the most horrible circumstances in your life, you can find constancy in and only in Jesus. If you belong to him, not only will you survive the turmoil, but you can actually thrive in the midst of it. The second thing that I wanted to point out is that life is a minefield. So we need to have our mind detectors going at all times. I would encourage you to know yourself. Uh, Paul the Apostle talks about a, uh, a sober judgment. We need to know ourselves, our weaknesses, the temptations that easily overcome us, the areas in life that we need to grow in. We also need to know our enemy and the unfair tactics that he will use to bring you into temptation or into despair. The battle for the Christian is real, but our God is more powerful, and he can lead us successfully through the minefields of anxiety and temptation if we will remain alert and if we will remain connected to him. Let's pray. And Lord, we do pray that you would really help us during this coming week to stay connected to you, not only, Lord, in prayer, but also in your word. Father, we don't want to face those times that are coming on this planet that you talk about in this chapter. And just even right now, with those who are here in this place, or watching or listening live or in another time or place, I don't want you to be scared into God's kingdom. 
I want you to come because you realize that you have sinned, that you have fallen short of the glory of God, that the wages of that sin is death, eternal separation from God and all that is good. But the free gift of life is found in Jesus Christ, that he gave his life freely so that you could live life fully. The answer to avoiding these final seven years of Earth's history is to bow your heart and your life before Jesus Christ and say, I have sinned, but you died for me so that I could be forgiven. I want you to take control, be the captain of my ship, be the Lord of my life, be the king. And he will do it. And then when he descends and gives that shout, you will go to be with him, celebrating and victorious for all of eternity. Do that today. Tell somebody else what you've done and begin studying God's word to understand what it is that you've done by coming into his kingdom. For those of us who already know you, Lord, my prayer is that we would be focused on you as our constant, that you would give us situational awareness of what is taking place in our lives with the anxieties and temptations of this age. You would help us to remain connected to you at all times so that we can be strong and that, Lord, when we do fall, you would pick us up, show us your great forgiveness and love, and strengthen us for that next temptation that we are going to face. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming this morning.